Good afternoon and welcome to a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Jeffrey Gomez, uh, a discussion of transmedia. And I am thrilled to introduce Jeff Gomez, President and CEO of Starlight Runner Entertainment. What's up? <laughs> uh, I think, Jeff, a, a good place to start uh, before we get into specifics of the genre is talking about, in general terms, um, what, what a good definition of transmedia storytelling is uh, around the story bible and things of that nature, just to sort of set the sure, base. Sure, sure. Well, um, uh, I'm glad you guys were able to come and check this out. Um, transmedia and transmedia narrative is something that has been uh, traditionally thought of as something academic, something that um, uh, was discussed at places like MIT and so forth. But what has really happened in recent years is that um, uh, the big movie studios, the networks, um, even independent artists, they're realizing that it costs so much money to create these um, uh, uh, rich worlds in these TV series, in these movies, in these video games, that it pays to leverage them across multiple media platforms and engage young people in ways that they want to be communicated with. Um, so the content is no longer being repurposed from one platform to the, the other. We saw that in the previous uh, seminar here as well. Um, uh, so the story world is extended across multiple media platforms in different ways, ways that play to the strengths of the individual media platform. Um, and um, uh, what you need to do to, uh, to make that work is to centralize your concept so that different teams can have resources to extend the narrative properly. Okay. And so just for the audience here that, that, that might be a little bit more of a traditional TV audience, is, is how does it differ from traditional TV marketing or, or, or film or, or, you know, film franchise marketing, just... Sure. Um, the, the, um, when, when we talk about transmedia storytelling, a lot of people think about Star Wars because Star Wars has a central um, uh, universe, a fictional world that um, manifested itself as movies and then um, uh, all kinds of other products, all of which are, seem to be set in the same world. Um, and most recently, they're manifesting as a TV series. What's interesting about Star Wars is now the TV series has become the driving platform for the, um, uh, for the property. And, and television has so much incredible power because of the, the exposure uh, that, um, that it can yield. Uh, a lot of uh, 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 transmedia implementations are um, uh, engaging television as the driving platform. Uh, so the, the new models are, um, are leveraging TV, like shows like Lost or Dexter or Battlestar Galactica, uh, a lot of shows that have genre appeal where uh, you generate uh, strong fandom, fan followings. Uh, they're willing to go on to other media platforms in order to engage with the world and the content and the characters. Okay, so, so if, if that's sort of a, a broad-based definition uh -huh. of, of transmedia storytelling, maybe we could dive into uh, a little bit of the creative process of, of sure. how it's done and, and, and how you, uh, as a creator uh, of, of transmedia stories, how do you start and, and, and sort of develop, make, and package that content? Sure. Hopefully, if that's not too much of a... <laughs> There's a lot of work involved. <laughs> So listen, the, um, uh, what's really remarkable is that um, uh, the skill set that it takes to pull multi-platform narrative together um, has become its own uh, television and movie credit. Uh, uh, I'm with the Producers Guild of America, and the Producers Guild last April ratified the transmedia producer uh, credit. And, um, and what we as transmedia producers do, and what anybody here can do, is recognize the fact that the content is very rich. 
because that's how you can tell whether um, this is going to lend itself to a transmedia implementation, that you have a world that exists beyond the borders of the television screen um, because it's so deep and rich. Um, then you make the, the commitment to leverage actually fairly standard uh, um, uh, procedures with regard to, to extending through marketing, uh, through sales, and through uh, audience uh, interaction, the only difference that, um, that we're advocating is to make the, um, the so-called advertising, the marketing and so forth, um, uh, in indicative of the universe, the story. So you are literally nurturing the story world as opposed to simply uh, uh, flashing in an advertisement for it. Okay. And is, is there ever a concern in, in terms of the, uh, of the different levels of storytelling that you're going to dilute the main story too much? Or, and, and so, and what is the overall goal of, of, the, of the secondary text? Is it always to sort of bring it back to the, to the, to the main text or the main story? That's a uh, very good point. Um, I feel that if you have uh, a story world that's actually fairly rich, um, uh, you're, you're going to draw people who want to get lost in it, who want to be uh, fans of, of the property. And what you're really doing is you're servicing that fan by giving uh, the fan a little bit extra. Now, I don't mean extras like you see on DVD extras, which are sort of, you know, crappy stuff. <laughs> um, what you really want to do is, is give us new insight, um, it, uh, artistically engage the, the consumer with this added content, um, this kind of satellite content to make it um, uh, a, an important part. Uh, every stuff is in, every, every piece of content is in game, is a part of the continuity of the world, and every part of it is kind of important, um, kind of interesting, uh, a new insight. Once you establish that, um, uh, your, your fans are rewarded, your audience is rewarded, they tell other people about it, they feel important in the living room because they're telling you something that you didn't know about those characters, um, and it encourages them to go right back to the show itself on television. Okay, good. So maybe, uh, you know, at this point in the, in the conversation, we can go into sort of, you know, what is a, a working model of this? So in other words, um, when a client comes in to, to, to work with you, is it, are, are you working with a client's vision and, and, and how much of the, of the transmedia process is determined by the client's own vision and, you know, in, as resulting in that product? Absolutely. Um, this is um, uh, the real trick to uh, successful transmedia implementation. Um, the reason why a, a lot of these things don't work out very well um, uh, is that um, uh, you have a, a digital division working on some aspect of your show and they're not communicating with the showrunners. They're sort of uh, making something up and sticking it there and more or less it seems like a part of uh, the, the show's world but if you look at it closely the characters are speaking in slightly different ways or out of character or it's not the same voice as, as the character um, in, in the show. It's not really working out. Um, uh, the, the, the job of a good transmedia implementation is actually to delve deeply into the core property um, and elicit what makes that property successful and, um, and uh, realizes the vision of the creators of the property uh, in ways that uh, establish a bond of trust between the creator and the developer of the ancillary content and um, uh, actually maybe conveys a little of that vision um, off into these kind of satellite uh, properties so that it really feels of a piece, of a whole. Okay. And who has the final say on on creative in terms of in terms of the process, we we really like for the uh, the core visionary, um, the showrunner, uh, the, um, uh, the the franchise creator to have uh, the the ultimate say. We hope that he'll be sensitive to the marketing needs and the needs of the licensees and so forth, but it's up to him ultimately. Okay, and in terms of what what we've set up in terms of the working process, maybe we could get into 
how this has come into play with some of your recent successes. Sure, sure. And, and, and maybe as a case study, we could talk about uh, Tron Legacy and you could sort of take us through uh, what that experience and process was like. Sure, sure. Um, uh, I want to uh, clarify, guys, that, that again, this uh, process is being used right now by many of the studios. Uh, and I'm talking about on, on a, a large, successful uh, franchises like Avatar and uh, a lot of the Disney brands like Tr Tron and Pirates of the Caribbean uh, by video game companies with Halo, um, uh, for example, or Gears of War. And, um, uh, and we've been involved with a number of them. Even toy companies generating entertainment content around uh, products like Hot Wheels. Um, and television becomes a key element in many of these things. So to focus on uh, Tron, uh, we, we worked on that a little bit. And um, uh, what's really fascinating about Tron is that Disney chose from the very early going to develop the Tron universe as a, a transmedia implementation. Um, and that means that decisions were made about the screenplay um, and about how the various divisions of the company would act in concert to develop not just the movie, but a universe, which then was extended out across all these different platforms so, in a highly coordinated way. So it was done in pre-production? It was done in pre-production. Okay. Um, that was rare for that time, but we're finding more and more uh, feature film and television implementations considering these things from the outset. Um, and, and again, specific to the audience here, television is becoming a, a, a how, does, how does it fit into the transmedia landscape? Well, is look, it becoming... let, let's carry the Tron example forth just for a moment more. What's so interesting is that um, uh, a Tron as a feature film was a nice hit for, for Disney. Uh, it wasn't necessarily a hyper blockbuster. It wasn't Avatar. Um, uh, and yet, Disney has greenlit uh, uh, yet another Tron film um, we just saw a, a week or so ago. Why? Well, because um, uh, just as a, a third party, my prediction is that the television implementation of Tron, which is going to be an animated series on um, uh, DXD, on, on, uh, on one of the Disney channels, it's going to become a driving platform. Um, kids are going to love this. Wait till you see it. It's, it's really cool. And um, it takes place actually before Tron Legacy. So it fills kids in on the backstory to this whole universe and how it came to be. They're going to love that story and it's going to generate consumer products and it's going to generate video games and, and things like that in and of itself to the point where by the time that next movie comes out, there's going to be a huge uh, anticipation wow. built yeah. up for it. So again, television is used as the driving platform in a transmedia implementation, um, and I think it's going to be successful. And were there parts of, of, of the toys or, or, or the television show that you were, you were saying extended beyond uh, the movie and sort of continued to build out that right, world? Right. Look how wonderful this can be. Um, uh, your job is to maximize the value of your intellectual property. You're sitting there um, and maybe you don't even want to be in the same room as everybody, every other executive in the company from all these different divisions that have very little to do with you. Um, and let's say you're Disney consumer products um, and the video game guys, um, uh, because there is a, a kind of clearinghouse being established for a product like, uh, uh, for a property like Tron, the, um, the video game guys show you all the new vehicles that are going to be in the video game. Well, you didn't even think that um, there could be a, a second line of toys that uh, fit perfectly into the Tron universe until you saw all those cool vehicles. Well. Um, uh, negotiations were done very quickly because they're all in the same company and boom there's a, a, a second or third line of toys going out that uh, not only um, extend the brand and extend the franchise but are pleasing to the fans because they're authentic they're a, kind of an official extension of the universe and then and then those cars are in the TV series. And of course, we will get to see them in action later on, I, I believe. Okay. 
Uh, then maybe, again, getting back to the key fits. So do you see uh, TV as a platform uh, uh, even getting bigger in the, in the transmedia storytelling process? Oh, without a doubt. Um, and this is global. Uh, uh, people around the world, um, the, the concern has been that, um, uh, especially on the younger end, um, uh, people in their 20s on uh, down to their tweens, they're, they're kind of moving away uh, from television a little bit to engage with video games and um, uh, the internet and, and, and so forth. What, um, what good transmedia can do is, um, is grab them through these other touch points with a, a property that will ultimately manifest in television. Um, so uh, what, what we're going to be seeing a lot of soon is that um, the web and video games um, and um, uh, uh, content that reaches kids through their video game console like Xbox Live and uh, PlayStation 3, um, they're going to launch the intellectual property and then uh, lead you to the driving platform, again, that being television. Right. We're going to be seeing more and more of that uh, very, very soon. And in terms of TV, do we want to talk about uh, some of the shows, especially serial dramas, that, that have done well or maybe not so well in the right. past, and, and, and maybe, uh, maybe say why sure. a, a show like Lost, which was such a mega hit globally, uh, but why it was successful in its transmedia storytelling and, and, and what went into that in your, in, uh, uh, as far as sure, you're concerned sure. that, that made it such a hit? Um, look, when, um, when we fall in love with characters and when we fall in love with engaging storytelling, a, a lot of us wouldn't mind spending a little more time in that world, especially in this day and age where that's so accessible. The difference between transmedia and a kind of cross-platform implementation is that when we go online, we're, not, um, we're no longer uh, trying to get involved with the personal lives of the stars of the show. Um, when uh, you have good transmedia implementation, like there was at points for Lost, you're finding out more about the universe, more about this Hanso Foundation. Uh, more about what those numbers actually mean and, and all that sort of thing. And you're enjoying yourselves and you get to talk with, uh, with fellow fans. You get to build a community around um, the, the lost universe. Um, and, um, and so, uh, fundamentally, good storytelling um, uh, yields this relationship, this intense relationship that is only magnified um, and generates uh, enormous... Uh, audience loyalty because they can dive deeper and deeper into that universe with this content online as Lost accomplished. Yeah. There are um, some drawbacks. Okay. Um, you can have uh, a serial drama that doesn't succeed even though there is uh, magnificent transmedia for it simply because, well, there might be um, a couple of pieces missing in the story engine. <laughs> um, the, the original story. In the original story engine on the driving platform, television. And uh, let's name names. <laughs> um, look at Heroes. Heroes is fascinating because it was generating tens of millions of additional dollars because the transmedia implementation was very, very successful. That first year, everybody went to read the comics and, um, and engage in their mobile phones and... Uh, go out and, and, uh, and buy the novels and things like that that tied in with heroes. Um, uh, and, um, and so NBC immediately uh, uh, renewed it, and we were there for a second year. The, the problem, though, I believe, was that there were some elements in the fundamental fabric of heroes that made it difficult to maintain as a narrative. Um, and when you have problems with your core story, the transmedia can carry you for another year or so because it's bringing in all that money, but your ratings are going to start to go down. And ultimately, by the third year, uh, the ratings were depressed enough so that the, the money that was being brought in by this multi-platform implementation uh, was starting to waver, and, uh, and it, it collapsed ultimately. Okay. So you have to... Um, uh, 
create a new model of people for encouraging the showrunners and the writers to think about the super arc of the narrative. Where is this really going? If you're making it up as you go along, the audience, they're, they're savvy to it. They're, they're going to get it fast. Um, and the problem is that writers and showrunners have been making it up as they go along because they're paid by the season. Um, that's got to change. They're, if you're going to do a, uh, a serial drama, we have to think about what the super story arc is going to be like and as kind of um, uh, conductors, as, as, someone, as people who are including all these different platforms in their imagination with regard to how to tell the story, they have to think seriously about what that's going to be like and how that's going to move and flow to take the audience out and then back, out and then back into the show over the course of years. Um, and um, we're just starting to see that kind of imagination, that kind of financial commitment on the part of the networks who need to pay a little bit more uh, to, uh, to, to get that kind of creativity out of their showrunners. Um, but, um, but I'm confident that that's going to be happening. And do you, do you ever get the sense that, and again, just in talking about heroes, do you ever get the sense that, that the transmedia storytelling may have affected negatively at all the, the core story or the further development of that core story because there was such uh, uh, an involved world in the, in the transmedia? You know, I, I don't think so. I, I think that, um, that you have to observe uh, uh, primary rules in, in this day and age. Um, that first Matrix movie was spectacular. Everybody loved The Matrix. Right. Um, Matrix uh, 2 and 3, however, did rely um, so heavily on the, the transmedia for key pieces of information that you had to have a PhD in, in Matrix in order to go to those movies and understand what the hell was going on. Uh, so you had to play the entire 100-hour video game and watch the Animatrix on DVD and read somebody's philosophical treatise in order to get what was going on in the second and third movies. So that's too much. That's right. too much work right now. Maybe in the future that'll be cool, but, but right now it's too much work. We need for um, the uh, essence of the story and a feeling of, of fulfillment and completion uh, from the, the feature film or the television show. The transmedia needs to enrich, deepen, maybe even reverse our feelings about characters and narrative threads that are happening in the TV show, but the TV show needs to operate uh, a function without uh, the, the transmedia. In the case of Heroes, to be specific, you're, um, you're, again, you were dealing with some fundamental narrative problems that transmedia couldn't help or hurt. Gotcha. It, it just, you know, gotcha. th there were difficulties yeah. there. And uh, I, I would say at this point, if anyone in the audience has questions, please feel free and, and, uh, uh, for Jeff, and we'll take them. Um, staying on that current track, Jeff, I would say, you know, in terms of current programming right now, it, it, are there shows that are doing transmedia fairly well or, or, or well, or uh, is that something that... that, that uh, maybe the networks aren't getting right right now? What is your feeling well, overall? Well, um... Uh, uh, people don't uh, think about it too often, but I believe that Glee um, does transmedia beautifully. And Glee is not a big science fiction show, and it's not uh, uh, necessarily um, a, a show that you would think offhand uh, would be a, a transmedia-ready show. But look at how wonderfully Glee cultivates its relationship with a mass audience base. Uh, okay, so you, you have these characters with, with whom the fans really empathize. They're, they're selling the songs um, from, uh, from the, the show, yeah, so, so. which uh, through iTunes and things like that, right. which the fans are buying. These are songs that are like 20, 25, 30 years old in some cases, which have been recontextualized by your experience with the show. Um, so e even if you've never heard of the songs before, you're buying them because you, you like the way they, they were, were sung, but also those songs are leading you to the original artist's version of, of the songs, so that's generating money for the uh, record label and the original artists, which is wonderful. Um, and 
um, if you love Glee, you're going to go out and m maybe perform a flash mob somewhere in a shopping mall. And what Glee does is watch you and then uh, perform a, a flash mob in a shopping mall in one of the episodes. Right. It's like you're singing to Glee and Glee sings right back to you. And, and the feeling that you get when you have that bond um, is very intense and a very deeply uh, personally involving. You then can go to the stage show, which shows a different facet of the Glee universe, and they're jumping off the stage dancing with you. And, and again, even if it's just a few people, those few people are running online to talk about their experience and sharing it with everybody else. And that's creating this uh, fundamentally wonderful transmedia uh, uh, experience. Cool. And so if, if, uh, if Glee is an example of, of a TV show that's sort of knocking it out of the park in that regard, are there specific companies right now that are taking the lead in, in, in the field? And, sure, and, and sure. who would they be? Um, uh, uh, guys, think about what has happened at the Walt Disney Company. Um, the, the person in charge of that uh, studio uh, now is Sean Bailey. He came up through um, uh, Live Planet. Um, uh, that was uh, Project Greenlight and things like that. The very first. Uh, internet and television and feature film mixture. Right. And, um, uh, and so within uh, 10 or 12 years, he's now running the Disney studio. And of course, he brought Tron, Tron Legacy, uh, to the studio. Um, I would imagine, I don't have uh, too much inside scoop, but I would imagine that um, Disney right now is in the process of transforming themselves into a generator of multi-platform experiences, true transmedia. Uh, what they, I think they need to do is beef up um, their fan and audience relationships so that there is more of a direct interaction with the fans. But we're going to be seeing that, I believe, really soon. So Disney is, uh, is great with that. Um, uh, we're seeing Microsoft adopt this sort of thing, uh, taking um, uh, video game like properties Halo or... like Halo and uh, preparing them to, to be moved across different media platforms and I think very successfully. Um, we've even seen um, mid-level video game companies like THQ take video game properties that may not be mil billion dollar blockbusters but are still fairly successful and develop sci-fi channel uh, feature films with them. And, um, and that will be very interesting to watch because those are not simple adaptations of video games. That tends to be unsuccessful. What this is, is it's fleshing out the backstory and mythology of that video game and creating very real, very compelling characters. And that's, that's exciting to, uh, to watch. And so if there are people in the audience from you know, production companies, studios, networks, and, and they want to start the process of being able to develop in more of a transmedia world. Is it, is it purely a money play? In other words, that, that, that more investment is needed? Or what are, what are the sort of core components that need to, that, that to, one to come would into need place. to assemble? Okay. The, the main reason we've encountered for why transmedia implementation is not done is fear. <laughs> um, uh, uh, corporations are quite siloed. And uh, in order for these things to happen successfully, you need to actually sneak outside of your silo for a few minutes and help out the dude in the next <laughs> cubicle. Um, and, um, and in fact, you, you need to, to create circles, what we call uh, clearing houses or task forces, that allow for the rules to be bent, for example, on how you can spend money. Because sometimes the money that you spend might perish the thought, help out somebody else in another division. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so we need to get over this and, and uh, make a stand uh, for the integrity of the intellectual property. The, the, the story world has to be held above politics and, and the various divisions in order to, uh, to become successful 
across uh, various media platforms. And, and for companies that have existing and, and owned content, you know, obviously you talked about uh, going forward, there, there are stuff being done in pre-production so that sure. the thought process is there initially. Yes. Are there certain, if, if there are existing properties, are there certain key components that an executive sh would, would look at and say, this could be good to, to extend into a transmedia world? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, some of those components include the fact that this is, a, a, for example, a high-end uh, program. It's expensive, <laughs> you know. Right. We need a better return on our investment. Let's generate content that's worthy of being paid for on, on other media platforms like a video game or like a, um, uh, a novel or, or things like that. Um, uh, so. Um, it takes a commitment at that level to, uh, to engage uh, with the various divisions and perhaps bring in a transmedia producer to coordinate that and, and make, it roll, uh, make it roll forward. Um, the, the other element is, of course, a visionary, a showrunner who um, will cooperate with you. Um, it, was, uh, it was very tricky for the showrunners of Dexter to, uh, to commit to transmedia implementation around Dexter through Showtime uh, because they were very protective of the intellectual property. Uh, only after uh, the powers that be at Showtime demonstrated that um, the people involved in creating this ancillary content, these webisodes and these trading cards, even these bobbleheads, <laughs> um, uh, cared deeply about the franchise and, and uh, took care to understand it uh, fundamentally so that the extension would read as authentic and qualitatively match what, what the show was doing. Right. Cool. Uh, I just wanted to open it up if anyone had any questions for Jeff at this point. Yes, sir. I think we got a mic coming up to you right now. Excellent. Yeah, I was just wondering in terms of pitching a series, do you think bringing a transmedia package to the pitch is a, is a big bonus for companies looking for properties? That's a great question. Excellent question. Um, my feeling at this juncture... Did, I just want to make sure. Did oh, everybody okay. hear the question? The question was, uh, when going in to make a pitch of a new show, uh, is it helpful to, or, or, or is it... Uh, uh, pertinent to bring a full transmedia pitch along with that show. Right. Um, the, the answer is yes, but conditionally. There are still a few uh, uh, factions out there that think that transmedia is some kind of buzzword and that it's going to be a passing trend and we'll just get back to good old-fashioned linear storytelling with commercial interruptions in our television. Um, uh, so my suggestion actually would be um, hook them with story. Uh, make sure that it's front-loaded as a really compelling narrative. Um, and then have a little section up back or in your presentation materials and so forth that clearly um, imagines what those extensions can be like. Okay? You don't want them to have to, you don't want to force them to commit to transmedia implementation in your first pitch meeting. Um, but that you've got it kind of worked out, and, um, and here's how you can tell in these meetings whether you've worked it out or not. Um, uh, we've seen a million uh, pitches where you go, and it works as a video game, and it works as a, an app, and, and so forth. And they may even have a little picture to show of like the video game box or something like that. It's not good enough. Um, uh, work with some people who understand the language of video game development or of, of web implementation and so forth so that you can show who you're talking to that you understand that language and you are thinking in creative ways about how to leverage the strengths of the individual platform. Don't go into a dissertation because it's intimidating and because um, they'll think that you're not trying to be loyal to television heaven for fend. So, so um, just um, uh, have that ready as a backup and, uh, and present uh, only toward the end, for now. And, and, and just sort of follow up on that, from a, from a realistic sort of standpoint, would you say that the, the most important thing would be sort of an online 
if we were talking cost effectiveness, sure. an online extension to your series to engage that audience, is that near the I, top? I might agree it's near the top simply because um, any network uh, is, is going, and any production company is going to want to do something uh, right. online uh, with, uh, with their budget for, with their marketing dollars and so forth. So I believe that this is just a wise um, application of that very money. If you're from Canada, by the way, you have to think about this. Um, it's how you're going to get funded these days. So, um, so it really pays to start thinking about it. It's almost as if there's a transmedia law in, in Canada. You're not going to get anything done. Uh, our phones are ringing from the Canadians a whole lot. I like that. Uh, additional questions for? Yes, sir. Hi, the programs you're talking about uh, are very strong content brands by themselves. Does that make it more difficult to, if an advertiser wants to integrate into these programs? Uh, or how can an advertiser take advantage of transmedia type content? Oh, I, that's, that's a, a wonderful question. Um, I think that there's so much that's uh, potentially attractive to an advertiser with transmedia. Uh, because um, what you're giving them is additional real estate um, uh, to, to advertise on. And um, uh, no matter what the, the central program is, even if it's like a reality show or, or, or things like that, if the advertiser is, if it can be demonstrated to the advertiser that this is going to be kind of a, a vital and engaging component of the overall experience, they can uh, brand around it, you know, in the framework of it. Um, or if you're clever and your uh, content is uh, based on a contemporary experience, there may be uh, more and more interesting ways of integrating the brand into the narrative itself. Uh, Lost did that with Jeep. Um, and you saw all these vehicles uh, in, uh, on the island and, and, and so forth, and especially in the online content. Um, so, um, it, it takes a little extra imagination and a desire on the part of the showrunners to be okay with that sort of thing. But once it's done, if it's done cleverly, it's really cool. If it's done in kind of a silly way that, that kind of thumbs its nose at the integrity of the narrative, uh, you're really going to turn off your audience and, and, and it could uh, backlash against you strongly. And, and Jeff, what, what has your experience been in terms of, and I, I know you've done work with Coca-Cola and, and other large brands, and, and, and how is it working with them in terms of the core mythology or storytelling? Are they sort of trusting of you and the, and the other producers, or do they really want to sort of impose a little bit more of their will or messaging in, in what you're doing? Sure, yes. We've worked directly with uh, advertisers, and a part of the role of the transmedia producer is to engage with um, uh, the, the advertiser to make sure that there's that level of, of satisfaction. Licensees and things like merchandisers and so forth uh, also. And, um, and again, this falls down to the ability to generate a fundamental bond of trust. Um, uh, there is uh, something that a, a transmedia producer can do to delve into brand essence. Is the message of Coca-Cola being communicated through all of these different uh, Coke side of life or happiness factory uh, commercials and transmedia implementation? If it's not, something's missing. Something's, uh, uh, there's going to be a problem. Um, uh, uh, but we have to... Um, understand the core messaging that's going on and the archetypes and the aspirational elements of this product uh, and make sure that that exists even if the product's not being pushed in your face right. constantly. Okay. Excellent. Uh, other questions? Um, let me speak to the international yes. uh, uh, component which I think is really fascinating. Uh, those of you who may be from uh, uh, Central or South America, um, uh, one of the really interesting trends we're, we're noticing is um, in things, again, that are not traditionally thought of as, as fodder for transmedia extension. Uh, soap opera, the telenovela, fascinating. Um, we're seeing uh, Global in uh, Brazil. Brazil. 
we're seeing um, uh, Televisa in, uh, in uh, Mexico. We're seeing a, a number of, uh, and certainly the, um, the companies in Venezuela who are producing these novellas are actually, um, from the start, uh, uh, considering the use of social media and, um, and multi-platform in order to uh, staunch the hemorrhaging of younger viewers. Um, uh, in, in this culture, you're, um, uh, even as a, a young adult, you're still watching those novelas in yes. prime time. Well, you know, they're starting to, to leave and become engaged with different media platforms. Uh, and now these companies are reaching into those media platforms, not just with uh, profiles of the celebrities or um, uh, coverage of what's happening next in the, in the soap opera, but with character interaction. So we're going to see the characters from the soap operas have their own Twitter accounts and Facebook accounts and engage um, the audience members and uh, the writers are going to integrate some of that response back into the narrative. It's really fascinating. Yeah. Uh, I call it playing with the canon. Um, uh, and we're going to see that more and more in all kinds of transmedia implementation. The fact that you can actually become involved in the drama as it unfolds and be validated for your participation in some small way. Yeah. Um, uh, this is going to be happening more and more. No, that, I mean, that's, it's super interesting. And maybe you wouldn't make that connection with the, with the soap opera, but in terms of really going after those young people in, in prime time and sure. keeping them engaged, and is, is that something you see translating back to the U.S. in terms of sort of all sorts of of primetime drama oh, or comedy? Oh, absolutely. Or? I, I think so. I, I think um, there, are, um, the, there are a number of uh, legal factions, in fact. Uh, um, the, um, the ABA, the American Bar Association, um, uh, there are um, independent groups of attorneys who are working on the issue of this remix culture, this, um, uh, this notion that uh, your content is being um, co-opted in, in a negative uh, light to, as far as they're concerned uh, by uh, these young people who are doing all kinds of interesting things with them and expressing themselves uh, artistically. What they're learning now is people do that out of love. And uh, to stomp that out and crush uh, remix culture is to uh, uh, damage your relationship with your own audience. So um, now we're thinking about how we can actually encourage that and perhaps one day monetize <laughs> that relationship um, so that um, uh, we, we have uh, a fan base that is uh, allowing for their own sense of self-expression and their own deeper involvement with the property. Excellent. Well, I think we are out of time, sir. I think that's a very good way to leave it. Ladies and gentlemen, let's have a hand for Jeff Gomez from Starlight Runner. People, we, we barely scratched the surface, okay, obviously. So, um, I'm committed to making sure that all of you uh, understand as deeply as you care to understand what this is because it is really happening. Um, and, and it's inevitable. It's not a buzzword. It's a certain type of cross-platform implementation that's going to continue and proliferate because of the mentality of young people today. It's permanently changed. It's, it's just going to keep going. So, um, uh, at Jeff underscore Gomez is my Twitter. <laughs> um, Starlight Runner Entertainment on uh, Facebook. And Jeff at StarlightRunner.com is my email address. Just write and explain clearly what it is that you're, you're trying to get, and I will respond and assist you in any way that I can. Okay? Very cool. All Thank right. you, sir. Thank you. Great. Fantastic. Absolutely.